Welcome back to Settlement Nation. I am your host, Courtney Barber, joined today by my co-host, Chris Boer, and Dan Shar, a trial attorney from Carpenter, Zuckerman, and Rowley from California. Now, for everyone who is an avid listener of Settlement Nation, you may remember Dan from episode eight. So he's also our first returning guest, and we're so glad to have him back on. Welcome back, Dan. Good morning. Thanks. Thanks, Courtney and Chris. It's nice to be back. Oh, we're super happy to have you back. And we did say we would. So we keep true to our promises. Um, Now, last time that we spoke, which was back in 2020, you did mention this case that you had coming up against Goldman Sachs and how, you know, and now it has actually been featured in Vanity Fair, which is huge. Um, For everyone listening, this is an article that was published actually this week, April 13, 2021, titled Bullying, Booze and Chokeholds, A Former Intern's Abuse Suit Moves Forward, written by William Cohen. So, Dan, between when we had you on last time and now, like what has actually happened? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, it it is very interesting. You know, a lot of things have happened in in the case from a a legal point of view. Uh, And then, of course, you know, um, William Cohen doing this article uh, sort of fell into our laps. I mean, for those that don't know William Cohen, um, he wrote a book a few years ago, a few years ago called Money and Power, How Goldman Sachs Came to Rule the World. Uh, And he's written other books as well. He's covered a number of other issues on Wall Street. um, And he's, you know, he's got kind of hands on experience because he worked on Wall Street for over 17 years uh, before coming, becoming a writer. And uh, last week, he sent an email to my co-counsel on this case, Bill Green, up at uh, Delfino Green and Green. And he was he was asking us about the case. So uh, knowing who he was, uh, Bill and I kind of chatted and, and it worked well with my schedule. So I called William Cohen and uh, that's what basically led to the article that's uh, that was published in Vanity Fair this week. So, Dan, can you take us right back to the beginning of this case and who is Patrick Blumenthal? Yeah, so so Patrick uh, is he's originally from the East Coast. He's from Philadelphia and uh, just an incredibly intelligent young man with a, a very, very bright future in front of him. Uh, in fact, after he graduated high school, he took a year off. You know, a lot of us take years off after after college, but he took a year off before starting college um, and started his own company. Uh, involved with manufacturing of of electric aircraft. So that's what he did first um, when he was 18 years old. And then uh, when he turned 19, he enrolled in the fall of 2016 at Drexel University, which is in uh, Pennsylvania. And he was majoring in finance, minoring in physics and computer science, extremely active on campus, had a bunch of leadership roles, club memberships, Great GPA. I think he had a a greater than a 3.9 GPA and was the only freshman at Drexel University to secure a very, very prestigious internship at Goldman Sachs uh, starting the following year in in September of 2017 is when he started his internship with Goldman Sachs. And, And what happened to him during his internship? So, you know, the the article kind of touches on this, um, but let's, I can kind of go big picture. There was a lot of things that happened in the, in the first five months of this internship, which are very well documented in the suit, very well documented in Mr. Cohen's article. Um, But really the, the, the incident that, that sort of changed everything happened on February 9th, 2018. Um, And, and this event by all accounts radically altered Patrick's professional life, his personal life, his aspirations. And and, and what happened was one night uh, after work, it's actually, they had these, what they call first Friday events, which were these uh, events that were put on by Goldman Sachs on Fridays. And so that evening while he's at this after work event, uh, Patrick and uh, a man by the name of Julius Arukamoff, uh, who was an investment advisor at Goldman Sachs. uh, So uh, an employee of Goldman Sachs, They were involved in an altercation at this restaurant bar called Sauce in San Francisco. And uh, the altercation resulted in Patrick being placed in a chokehold by Mr. Arukamoff uh, to the point of where Patrick passed out. And when he fell to the ground, he he slammed his head into the concrete um, and was knocked out. Uh, while, while he was passed out during the whole cold, the chokehold, and then he remained unconscious on the sidewalk for a number of seconds. Uh, 
Uh, and I think it's really important to note that when this event took place, Patrick was 21 years old, five foot five, and probably 130 pounds soaking wet. And Mr. Arukamov was 5'10 and weighed 200 pounds. So there's a, a huge physical difference between the two of these men. Uh, when Patrick came to, uh, he had urinated on himself and he didn't know where he was. And this incident was, was witnessed by a number of Goldman Sachs interns, associates, analysts, and at least one senior Goldman Sachs employee uh, who held a management level position, um, which becomes very important in regards to the, the case against Goldman Sachs, uh, which we can get into in a little bit. Um, in spite of having been knocked out, in spite of passing out during the chokehold and being unconscious for a number of seconds on the sidewalk, no one called an ambulance. And Patrick was allowed to be taken home by none other than Mr. Arukamov himself. Uh, there are aspects of this case that are, are, are laid out pretty well in the suit, as well as the article about what transpired at Patrick's home uh, between he and Mr. Arukamov. And uh, there is a disagreement. There are discrepancies uh, in, uh, I shouldn't say discrepancies, there are just disagreements uh, as what Patrick recalls being said to him and what Mr. Arukamov says. And I think it's probably best that uh, we let our listeners review the Vanity Fair article and look at the lawsuit to see um, what the, the varying accounts are. But I am pretty confident knowing the evidence in this case that once our jurors hear and see the evidence that they are, uh, they're going to see the case our way. Now, Dan, just, you know, on that note and thinking about that, I know if I put Chris into a chokehold, I probably wouldn't be asked back to work <laughs> on Monday by uh, Independent Life or Settlement Nation. So without a doubt, there must have been drastic and swift action taken against this Julius character from Goldman's. Am I right? Well, um, you know, it, it kind of depends upon how you define drastic actions. If you mean by drastic actions that he was immediately fired. No, no, he wasn't. Um, what, what I can tell you uh, is that uh, Goldman Sachs uh, has indicated that they conducted uh, an investigation. Uh, at the conclusion of their investigation, they told Patrick Blumenthal that they, quote, had taken actions they deemed appropriate. Um, but those actions did not result in Mr. Rukamov being terminated. Uh, and in fact, he remained at Goldman Sachs for a number of months after this incident uh, and eventually left Goldman Sachs uh, under his own accord. You mentioned the investigation. Is that complete? And if so, like how, in, in your view, how thorough was that investigation from, from, from your perspective? Well, so to answer the first part, uh, from what we've seen, yes, the investigation, uh, how, whatever you want to call it, uh, is complete. Now, uh, we do have to be a little cautious with things. There is a protective order in place during this uh, on this case. So uh, I, I cannot comment in great detail. Um, what I, I can tell you is uh, that Goldman Sachs was immediately aware of this incident. As I mentioned to you before, there were a number of Goldman Sachs interns and employees and a senior level manager who all witnessed the event. Um, shortly thereafter, it was either the, the, the day after the next day, he was contacted by members of HR and they connected Patrick up with the wellness department. Goldman Sachs has an internal wellness department. And during those conversations with the wellness department, Pat, Patrick informed them that he had gone to the emergency room, uh, not the, the day after, but the following morning. Um, uh, and in the emergency room, he had a CT scan that showed a bleed in his brain. And he informed Goldman Sachs of that fact. Um, at the end of March, so approximately five to six weeks after this event, on March 26th, he sent a formal email to Goldman Sachs, to the HR department, about two pages, detailing the events of what transpired. Uh, 
Now, keep in mind, I, it's it's important to remember that during this time period, which was close to six weeks, Patrick never returned to the office. He wasn't able to physically complete his internship. And so you'd think that someone at Goldman Sachs might have said, hey, um, where's Patrick? Why right. hasn't he come back to work? Maybe this is pretty serious, but by all accounts, that 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 didn't seem to be the case. Um, you know, and so he sends this email on the 26th. And, you know, to give Goldman Sachs credit, they replied right away. They said, We've received your email. Thank you. Please contact this individual, uh, another individual at the HR department that was actually based in the New York office of Goldman Sachs. So two days later, Patrick contacts this further HR person, this would have been on March 28th, said, hey, I, you know, I appreciate you reviewing my, my report. Please let me know if you need anything else. This is March 28th. Almost a month goes by. April 22nd, he receives an email and it's basically a two-line email. It says, our investigation is complete. We've taken actions we deem appropriate and that's it. Patrick has no memory of anyone from Goldman Sachs or their investigators contacting him after he filed his report on the 26th of March. And he doesn't have any emails between March 28th and April 22nd. Um, now, we've been provided documents and discovery related to what Goldman Sachs did, but unfortunately, uh, because of the protective order, I cannot get into the details of those documents. Right. And, you know, I'm not sure what they're doing at the wellness department at Goldman's, but I don't think a massage um, or a spa certificate <laughs> would have sufficed in this case. So um, I actually did some research, Dan, uh, about Goldman Sachs Online. And, you know, I did find numerous articles and also a lawsuit going back to 2010, which is a class action for gender discrimination with a about a thousand female employees. Um, I also found an article actually, which is really interesting. There's a quote I want to read from it uh, about the practices at Goldman's. It's titled Goldman Sachs exec leaves due to toxic culture. And it says this past week, veteran Goldman Sachs employee, Greg Smith submitted his reg resignation by the New York times due to the toxic culture that now permeates the organization. And he's quoted to be saying, I believe that I've worked here long enough to understand the trajectory of its culture, its people, and its identity. And I can honestly say that the environment now is as, as toxic and destructive as I've ever seen it. The firm has veered so far from the place that I joined out of college that I can no longer in good conscience say that I identify with what it stands for. Um, this is on top of other articles that I found saying that they pride themselves on restricting interns to working 17 hours a day. So nice of them to let people have a few hours off um, between 1 and 5 a.m. And other headlines that, you know, say that they're exposing the toxic culture of investment banking and what's going on at Goldman Sachs. So with all of that sort of together, what do you think this lawsuit means for the company and possibly for the overall industry? You know, a lot of what you brought up, I mean, it, it is, it's all it takes is a really simple Google, Google search to, to see uh, what's happening here. You know, the, the, the class action, that's the, the Chen Oster uh, class action regarding the gender discrimination. You know, you mentioned the, the 17 hour um, work day and, and yeah, that it's, it's, it's scary to understand that the, the reason why, why Goldman took that step is because an intern, not an intern at Goldman Sachs, but a, an intern at, I believe, Merrill Lynch, um, died. And, uh, you know, they believe that he, that this person had an epileptic seizure in, in the shower one morning because they had worked 72 hours straight. And that's what led to that, that 17 hour work day. Um, but, but I think we need to take a step back and, and to be brutally honest here. Um, and, and I think it's real unfortunate what I have to say to answer your question. Um, but I don't think this lawsuit means a whole lot to Goldman Sachs. Um, I mean, we, we talk about the Chen Oster case, which has been dealing with the gender discrimination allegations at Goldman Sachs. This has been a, a case, and of course, I have to say allegedly because it, it hasn't gone um, to, to verdict yet. Um, this has been allegedly happening for decades over a thousand claimants. Some of these claimants in that class action have been waiting for justice for close to 20 years. When you jump online and you see how this case has been defended, um, these claimants might get might get a trial date in early 2022. 
And so for some of them, this has been decades in the waiting. Um, Patrick Blumenthal is just one man, one young, one young man. He has an absolutely righteous case. And, and I have every reason to believe that when our San Francisco County jury hears this case later this year, he's going to get justice. Um, and while I'd love uh, the optimist in me <laughs> would love to say that this case is going to be the, 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 the proverbial straw to break the camel's back. Um, I don't know if, if that's the case, uh, but, but I would love to, to see some real changes happening. And I hope that, that this case, along with the other cases that are moving through the, the civil justice system, um, can, can affect Goldman Sachs and, and hopefully the industry overall. So you mentioned uh, Patrick's trial is coming up later this year, uh, I think in November. Uh, are you co-counseling that with anyone? Uh, what can you share about the trial? Uh, yeah. So what we've got, the, the, the team that, that has been put together in this case, um, you know, is phenomenal. Um, you know, the, the, the case originated with, uh, with Bill Green and Kaylin Sharp up at the firm of Delfino Green and Green. Um, I've been really fortunate to work on a number of cases with Bill and Kaylin. Uh, they, are, they are phenomenal. And uh, not only on a professional level, but a personal level, I enjoy working with them. Uh, I, of course, have my, my team directly in my office, Eva Silva and our, our super paralegal, Jillian Sullivan. Uh, and of course, Nick Rowley is, uh, is working the case with us as well um, when we, we head to trial in November. Um, and so it's, it is set in San Francisco County. Uh, San Francisco County is trying cases. Uh, they, they were actually one of the first counties here in California to, uh, to get back to in-person jury trials um, during the COVID pandemic. Um, Goldman Sachs and Mr. Arukamov have already attempted to get the case dismissed, thrown out of court, uh, and our, our court basically said no. Uh, no, this case is going to proceed forward. There are uh, viable allegations that have been made and uh, you're going to push to jury trial. Now, I have uh, no reason to doubt that um, Goldman Sachs and Mr. Arukamov will try to get this case thrown out again. Uh, I, 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 I'm sure that's going to happen. And, and the reason is simple. They don't want a public jury trial. And make no mistake about it, this will be a very public jury trial. And you know, they, they don't want a public jury trial because all the things that I don't get to talk to you both about today, all the things that we've learned in discovery, that's all going to come out. It's all going to be borne out in this public jury trial. And I'm very confident when the jurors see the evidence that we've gathered and that we will continue to gather in this case, um, that they will absolutely find uh, in our favor. And one other thing that, that com becomes very important and why Goldman Sachs is, is in this case, um, as I mentioned to you before, there's at least one senior management level individual who witnessed this event. And in order for us to hold, ask the jury to hold Goldman Sachs accountable, we have to have what's called ratification. In other words, we have to have evidence that it is more likely than not that Goldman Sachs, through their conduct after this event, ratified the conduct of their analyst, Mr. Arukamov. Um, we think the evidence is going gonna, is gonna to support that. And, and uh, we're, again, very confident that the San Francisco jury is going to see it that way. Dan, I want to talk a little bit about Patrick. Um, you know, this has had lasting effects for him and he is so young. And, you know, I used to work in this industry myself. So someone, you know, of that level, they could easily make over their career a high six figures every year. So we're talking about here, you know, loss of income, opportunity that he's missed out on now. And then there are the physical injuries that he has to deal with going forward. You know, I'm sure this all has to be taken into account in the trial coming up. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, it's it's important to note this is a civil case. Um, and, and even more important to note is Patrick is still continuing to work very hard. Um, but he's had to adjust. He's had to adjust his expectations. He's had to adjust his aspirations. You know, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is a young man who had a 3.9 GPA at Drexel University and was the only freshman to earn this very prestigious internship 
as a college freshman. Um, and, and we can't deny that fact, you know, in spite of everything that we, we know about Goldman that we've learned, the, the fact is, is that it's still a very prestigious internship. And, and, you know, I don't know about you, Courtney, I don't know about you, Chris, but I can tell you when I was 19 years old, there was not a wall street bank knocking down my door to say, Hey, Dan, come work for us. That, that, that just didn't happen. Okay. Um, it, it but it did for Patrick Blumenthal. And after this incident, he wasn't able to finish his school at Drexel. He tried, but he wasn't able to finish. He still hasn't been able to complete his undergraduate degree. And that doesn't mean that he's not still an intelligent young man. He just hasn't been able to finish that degree. We know he has a permanent brain injury. It's been, it's been documented in the CT scan in the emergency room, as well as an MRI scan that, we, that he had recently done. But even though he has this injury, he, he, he still has the ability to tap into his creativity, his resourcefulness, to try to find opportunities. Because the path that he was on, the, the path that, that he was on through Drexel, through Goldman Sachs, that path, it's not there. And it's, it's, <laughs> he's taken it in stride. Um, and there's a lot of other professional paths to success that, that, that have closed. Um, but he absolutely has the potential to, 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 to make a career, uh, uh, in this industry it, is he's on that same career path to make the money that he could have a, a, as a wall street banker. Um, I don't know. I think that's something that our medical experts are, are going to have to, to comment on. I have to defer to them. Uh, all that I do know is that our, his entire child, his entire trial team, me, Bill, Kalen, Nick, Eva, we are going to do everything we can to make sure that our jurors have all the evidence they need to ensure that Patrick gets the justice that he's entitled to. Absolutely. And, you know, why is it so important for people to hear and understand Patrick's story and for this justice to be had, not just for him, but for all these other people that I'm sure have gone through possibly similar experiences? You know, I think, I think it's important because, you know, Patrick is someone's son. He's someone's brother. He's someone's best friend. He, he's really, he's, he could be any of us. He is any of us. And, you know, we've seen, and you talked about this earlier, Courtney, through the, 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 the unfortunate toxic culture that, that permeates corporate America. We, we've seen this. And, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, you know, I, I, I'm hopeful. I'm still very hopeful that this case is going to make a difference. I, I don't know if it will, but I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Well, but I think if we take a step back and we look that if enough good people become aware of this and enough good people demand change, maybe something happens. You know, I think this last year we've seen the power of social movements, the power of Me Too, the power of Black Lives Matter. And while I understand that for a lot of us, it may be easier for us to relate to the Me Too movement and the Black Lives Matter movement, and maybe we can't necessarily relate to Wall Street and, and that type of culture and the bankers, um, I think we just, let's not focus on the bankers. Let's focus on the interns. Let's focus on these college kids who are just trying to get ahead and by all accounts are continuing to be taken advantage of. You know, take a stand like Greg Smith, you know, the, the, the article that you mentioned earlier where, where he walked away. Other people can look at this and walk away. If you're an investor, put your money somewhere else. If you're an intern, don't apply. You know, if you really want that Wall Street internship, go somewhere else. You know, Goldman Sachs makes money off your money and they make money off your money if you invest with them. But if they don't have the money to invest, if they don't have the new crops of interns and analysts to work through their machine, they can't succeed. And, and we know that corporations speak the language of money. And when they start seeing things affect their bottom line and their pocketbooks, that's when we're going to start seeing real change. And, you know, maybe I'm getting a little soapboxy here, um, but I think the more people that know about this, the more people that know about Patrick's story, the, the more people than that can then stand up and say enough is enough. And when enough good people do that and enough good people stand up for what's right, that's when we see change start to happen. And that's why it's so important for people to know Patrick's story. I couldn't agree more. And on that point, Dan, where can people follow the story? Can you give all your details as well so that 
um, our listeners can follow this along right up until the trial date. And of course, we'll have you back after you'll be our third time guest to uh, <laughs> get all the information. So give us the rundown about where they can follow all of this. Yeah. So I know that uh, William Cohen, uh, the, 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 the author of the recent article, he absolutely is going to be continuing to follow this case um, and he'll continue to follow it through trial. Um, you can always reach out to me. Um, you can follow me on Instagram. It's pretty simple. My name is Dan C. Shar on Instagram. We'll be putting posts to, to updates on that. Um, you can always send me an email. It's just D. Shar. You know, my initial first initial and full last name at, at czrlaw.com. Um, or you can text me, you know, 408-540-8343. Text me if you want to uh, chat about the case. Um, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're a bit limited um, in, 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 in what we can share in, until, until the case gets to public jury trial. And, um, you know, there's a, always the possibility that the, the trial will be uh, publicized on uh a broadcast on CVN. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's the best way that, that, that people can follow, but you know, it's, uh, yeah, there, there's, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. The, the next, uh, the next seven months, uh, really seven months to the day, uh, we'll, we'll be in, in San Francisco, uh, trying this case. Well, we really appreciate you bringing this to us at Settlement Nation and putting it out there. I mean, I can't thank you enough for sharing the story. And Chris and I are going to be following along very closely as well. So we just want to say thank you, Dan, uh, for coming on. Of course. Thank, thank you both for having me. It was, it was once again wonderful to chat with you. And, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully you all are staying safe and we'll be able to see each other in person soon. I miss you guys. <laughs> yes, us too. Um, and for all of our listeners, I will put all the links below how you can access the article, give it a read. It's super juicy and you'll be shocked at some of the stuff you read in that. Also, make sure you subscribe and comment on our podcast, on Apple Podcasts. We are slowly rising up the ranks, um, definitely in the top for a trial or a podcast now. So that's a little pat on the back for Chris and myself, but we couldn't do it without the great trialers that come on and share their stories. So once again, thank you, Dan, and thank you to everyone for listening. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks, Dan.